This is NMC Rough Cuts, presented by Bell. This podcast series is brought to you by the National Music Center. We're a registered charity that amplifies the love, sharing, and understanding of music from our home here at Studio Bell on Treaty 7 territory in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. I'm Graham Lassard, music producer and recording engineer at the National Music Center. Each episode of NMC Rough Cuts explores the songwriting and recording process of a compelling Canadian artist. Learn how an original song comes to life over a one-day recording session at Studio Bell and hear the story behind the tune. You can watch episodes at amplify.nmc.ca or listen anywhere you get your podcasts. If you enjoy the show, please take time to give a five-star rating and review. It really helps us out. Hi, I'm Graham Lassard. I'm at the National Music Center today, and I'm speaking to Joanna Borromeo. Hey, Joanna. Hey, how's it going, Graham? I'm good, thanks. How are you doing? Doing really well. Joanna is a musician, a singer, and songwriter based in Calgary. And over the last couple of days, we've been working together on one of her songs. Um, Just before we get into that, anyone watching the video has seen that we're set up in different rooms. That's so that we can take our masks off and be safe and comfortable in this chat. Yeah, at the time that we're all living through. So, Joanna, we've been working on your song, Boulevard, the last couple of days. Yes, and we've been working very hard. (laughs) In fact, we only stopped like about 30 seconds ago to sit down for a chat, and we might even have uh, a moment to sneak in one or two more things after we talk, right? Yes, yes, and that's because you're very clever at sneaking little things, finding opportunities to sneak, you know, takes in. That's all we can, that's that's all we can... uh, try and do in the studio when we've got a, a long list of um, cool things, cool sounds we want to explore, right? Like that was something that was to me really fun about the last couple of days is the uh, level of ambition and the um, the really detailed ideas that you came in with. We'll, we'll get into that in a second, but as far as the song goes, um, I think it's going to be different than maybe some of the other songs people have heard here in that it is a real uh, combination of different musical styles. Am I right in thinking that? I yep. think so, yeah. I mean, I um you have song, a broad palette of influences, that's for sure. Yeah, it's very much informed by um 80s funk and R&B, but there's also the whole neo soul sensibility that I grew up with. Um and then there's a little element of hip hop in there that y- it's hard to escape from these days. Uh, well, that's not, I don't mean to say that negatively. Um, it's just a very influential style of music that we hear throughout. Something that you enjoy listening to, I guess, if it Definitely. made its way into your song. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just elements of it, I would say. Um, how did you write the song, Boulevard? Uh, I guess the way that I typically do with all the other songs that I write, just on a piano and a pad of paper. And... Uh, um, I think I may have been in California at the time. Okay. Yeah, I, in the middle of a, a little mini tour. That's so interesting because um, when you hear it, I think, you know, hopefully people will agree, I don't necessarily think about someone sitting down at a piano and playing this song, right? Like it's gone through a few changes from that original conception. Yeah, definitely. Uh, a few more than a few, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> you know, putting to, together demos. The I think I might have like three or four demos yeah. of this song, and um, the latest demo that that I came to the studio with that was only pieced together in the weeks leading up to our session. Right. And it was, again, very different from (laughs) the other previous versions. So the demo that you're talking about um, actually even made its way into the studio, right? Like there's a lot of music in the recording that we worked on that you programmed, wrote, performed before you even set foot in the studio. Mm Mm-hmm. The bass line, for sure, which I spent hours and hours just getting it right (laughs) and it was actually kind of out of necessity because I knew that there was a long list of things that we had to um, make sure that we got through in the studio so I thought okay let's just get this performance down and have it you know have it uh, have it be on the track so that that 
That saved us a, f- a couple of hours, I think. Well, an and you got a great <laughs> bass sound, and it's it's played really well. You got to try a few takes. One of the things we did here is we listened to a few takes and chose the best from a couple of them, to, mm-hmm. you know, to compile for that. But I just think that you know it's super interesting. There's two things about this that I find really interesting. One is um, that you can produce such high quality recordings at your house. I think that is you know kind of more public knowledge now, um, and also that. Um, musicians making demos and then bringing those into a studio and then adding to them is a pretty uh, common way to work in, you know, the 21st century, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the last time I recorded something um, to the scale in the studio, uh, all of it was performed in the studio, and that was years ago now. It seems like a very long time wow. <laughs> ago. Um but uh, yeah, that's the wonderful thing about technology these days is there are um, digital versions of analog synthesizers mm-hmm. and um, there's samples, sample libraries and, and things that is at the tips of anybody's fingers these days. And, and there's good things about that and maybe not so great things about that too. I mean, I but, guess a, a really good thing about it is the barrier to entry is really low. Yeah. So if you have ideas and you're passionate about... Um, you know, seeing those through yourself, it's right in front of you. Mm-hmm. How did you learn about using, you know, music software and technology to produce your music? Because I introduced you as a musician, but, you know, you're a producer as well, right? You came in here with a beat that you made, with a bass line that you made, with um, some uh, auxiliary percussion and a whole bunch of different synth ideas, and you wrote and recorded those before you came to the studio. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, you know, it. Um, my setup at home is very strange. I wouldn't call it a proper studio or even a proper home studio. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, but um, outside of writing my own music, I, I gig as a musician. And so I play in various projects where um, I use um, I use a piece of software called Mainstage, uh, which is basically the live version of a um, a digital recording workstation. And, Mm -hmm. uh, the cool thing about this particular software, number one, it's, I think it's $40, (laughs) which is insane. Um, it's less expensive than a piano. (laughs) That's for sure. Yeah, definitely. And, uh, in addition to that, it has these, uh, it, it has these wonderfully well modeled virtual synthesizers that are based off of the synthesizers that are at this studio. Right, like some of the the vintage analog stuff that we, you know, I think there's a mixture of those on your track actually now, right? There's some stuff from the computer and then there's a bunch of the instruments from the collection here. Yeah, I think actually we've uh, overdubbed the... Um, some of the digital synth stuff that I've done, if not all of them. Oh, yeah. If I'm... Not mistaken. It's hard, and, to, it's hard to keep track. Uh, yeah. But uh, you know what's cool about coming in here is um, getting to see where these uh, these virtual synths come from. Or I guess, you know, it's, it's like, you know, you're coming to the source and realizing right. that the real thing is, uh, number one, these digital synths are pretty good at uh, recreating the sounds, but it, it's the tactile yeah. aspect of playing the the real thing and then um there is one element that digital s- modeled synths can't capture of that analog sound I, it's hard to describe okay. but um it's it, i think it's more inspiring actually it's there's the inspiration factor of of playing the real the real instrument and that was very very helpful in in our session the um the fact that you learned about this stuff sort of by necessity and then it found its way into um, your songwriting, I think, is also pretty interesting, right? Because in a way, you know, whether it's a, a vintage piece of gear or whether it's a piece of software, you've just sort of incorporated it as another instrument that you play. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. I, I, um, I'm finding that I'm using it more and more, um, this this setup here. And it's... it's uh, it's really great. I mean, it beats having to carry around five or six keyboards to a gig <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> to um, to play. Although it doesn't look as cool, 
you know, having right. one one keyboard and then a laptop. You know, it almost would feel way cooler to just be surrounded by, you know, half a dozen keyboards. You know, I don't I, know. I saw a show, a <laughs> concert one time where um, I couldn't figure out what the drummer's setup was. He had this crazy looking um, collection of wooden boxes. They almost looked like old music boxes or something like that. And they were all around his drum kit. And I just thought, oh man, that is, they, they looked beautiful. The design was incredible. And I thought they were instruments I'd never heard of before. Um, so I kind of was watching him as he unpacked or uh, tore down his kit after the gig. And they were all just beautifully carved wooden boxes that held like pieces of modern Apple technology. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh! Did uh, did that kind of um, ruin that moment for you? A well, no, bit? I understood why he did it because he mm. because of just exactly what you described there. Mm-hmm. Hey, so how did you get started in music? Was it playing piano? Was that the first instrument? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, the long, or sorry, the short version of that story is: um, um, my parents just thought, "Hey, let's let's." purchase a really affordable piano and let's just leave it in the living room to see if one of our kids would be you know intrigued by it and luckily for me I had an aunt who would come come by the house frequently and sit down at the piano with me and just we would tink, tinker around and I don't think she knows how to play <laughs> but she um just by having somebody there with me to just you know for me to just copy and just explore I don't know it was that sort of connection that we had that made it possible for me to explore the piano at the same time so that's how it started and um, lessons came maybe a couple of years later than that Um, after a trip to Disneyland actually Wow. (laughs) yeah Um, are you familiar with the that uh, that ride it's a small world it's it's a classic (laughs) yes of course it it still haunts me yeah I was just gonna say uh, do you have nightmares about that uh, that ride Uh, just kidding it's it's I mean it's amazing to um, to be on that ride and to see all of the different you know nationalities represented on that ride but the song that plays it's I don't know how long it's a short song but it's like it feels like an eternity as a child. <laughs> exactly, yes. <laughs> it's probably a 30-minute ride. Yeah. But uh, 30 minutes to a five-year-old kid is, I don't know, that's like a, at least a day and a half in, in a child's mind. Well, for anybody that hasn't been on that ride, <laughs> and I'll just explain that for the 30-minute ride, it, the song It's a Small World plays on a loop the entire time. Yes. So I think yeah. it I think it might even seem much longer to a grown up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know what? That's true. That's true. So after that trip, the first thing that I did apparently when I when I got back home was figure out the notes on uh on the piano That's to that amazing. to that song. Yeah. And and that was when my parents realized, okay, I think maybe she will be into taking lessons and so that's where it started. And so- I haven't stopped playing since in summary like that's kind of a that's such a a long slow build up right your origin story is your parents basically set a piano trap for you in the room (laughs) you you kind of started playing it by playing kind of like playing a game with your aunt yeah yeah and a couple years later the song that no one could ever get out of their head after going on that (laughs) ride you went back to that piano and figured it out yeah that would have been the only way i could you know, otherwise I wouldn't have, ha- there wasn't a guitar around, so I wouldn't yeah. have been able to fit it, figure it out there. But um, yeah, it was, uh, you know, I feel very lucky that my parents even had the the thought to, you know, have an instrument at home, you know, so I feel very, very blessed that way. And was writing um, your own song something that you started doing right away, or did you come to the writing part of it later? Mm, yeah, well, it's, Around the teenage years, you know, when you have a lot of things to say, (laughs) a lot of angsty things. Right. (laughs) That's when it started. Um, And uh, I did, I did start writing songs and I did start sequencing um, because at that point uh, the piano became a a keyboard that had a sequencer on it. Ah. Yeah. And uh, so it just went from there producing drum tracks and figuring out bass lines and all of that. So that I was a teenager at that point, didn't know what I was doing at all, but you know, I was ex- just like exploring it. Yeah, like. yeah, yeah. A sequencer is um, kind of like a really simple uh, way to record 
some music and have it play back, usually a short pattern or a sequence, which is why it's called that. Um, so you started programming beats and melodies even mm-hmm. as a teenager. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, At that point, I was listening to t- a ton of R&B okay. and pop music and yeah. and that sort of thing, just loving the sounds and trying to figure out, you know, oh, are, is that sound on this keyboard? Can I recreate that? So genres that, that incorporate a lot of electronic instruments, right? And a lot mm-hmm. of like sequenced um, bits or looped bits, mm-hmm. like a small passage that p- plays on repeat. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, this the past couple of days when we've been working in the studio here, something I thought about a lot is how different it is working on music like this than something that's performed acoustically by a group of musicians together, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, so different. Maybe for someone who hasn't experienced that, you can, and but you yourself have performed, you know, in, in both capacities. Can you tell us a little bit about the difference there? The difference. Yes. You know, uh, playing live with other musicians, there is a conversation that happens that isn't um, that isn't verbal unless there's lyrics. But you know, there's a lot of playing off of each other. Things happen on the fly. Um, there's just a an element of just energy that you can feed off of and give to other musicians that are there with you. So. Um, that's the that's the way that inspiration kind of um, happens hmm. is just listening to what everybody's doing in the moment. And so it's all about doing something that's for that moment, you know, filling the space in pieces together, <laughs> I, I guess would be the best way to describe it. At least that's my experience. Um, and then there's, there's also the opportunity for things to happen uh, that you don't plan. On, that, that you didn't plan right. and, and you just kind of stumble upon. And, and that's very, very cool. And it, it feels like magic and it feels like you're um, just on, on the same same page without having to say that you're on the same page. And I think that's, that's like the special thing about, about playing live with other musicians together. Um, in the studio, this is actually the first time that um, I'm working with just... Uh, you know, just one other individual, right? And and um, and Eric <laughs> as well. <laughs> so <laughs> technically, two other two individuals. Other, yes, yeah. thanks, yes, Eric. By the way, yes, <laughs> Eric. Oh my gosh, yes. You're the uh, you're the the top assistant. That's just like right there, um, and. Uh, that is a completely different experience and yeah. um it's taken a lot of planning and i think that's probably why i thought okay i better have this f- pretty like f- you know fleshed out demo you know um because you just there's no time to leave things to chance i think right you know so it's a different approach yeah. um and mm, it, it's there's a lot more pressure because yeah. um if you don't know what you want, you have to figure it out yourself. And you can't, you, you don't rely on the band to, to, to work something out. However, um, when you're with a really great producer slash engineer um, and, and somebody who's, you know, really great at, at understanding the whole creative process, um, working on songs in the studio, uh, you are like... Um, it's like having another bandmate in the room. Oh. You know, when we talked about um, this song that we were going to be working on in the process, you know, we talked actually about some of the things you've mentioned about how uh, different of a process it was to work in bits and pieces and how, you know, a way it was kind of more like animating something than like actually actors on stage performing, right, to use an analogy. And... Um, I think if you're not familiar with how you make music in the studio and you hear pop music that has electronic sounds, you can think that it's all from a computer. But the amazing thing is, whether it's electronic or acoustic, those are your ideas that we're hearing, right? Like you've had to actually be incredibly meticulous to develop this music because um, the drummer didn't do anything. And the bass player didn't do anything. Mm-hmm. 
mm-hmm. you wrote all the parts and performed them and then and then brought it to the studio and that was the starting point and even in the space of a day like the song changed so much from what you came in with mm-hmm. developed I should say not changed really yeah developed yeah I'd say so um and it's I mean it's I was hoping for that mm. you know 80 percent right you, you bring a demo in at 80 percent and then the 20 percent is is what you capture in the studio and it's usually that last 20 percent that's mo- the most uh exciting and then also the most challenging because it's that pressure (laughs) that we've been talking about and um you know it's and and then the last remaining 10 percent that's it it seems like oh it's only 10 percent that's going to be a piece of cake but it's usually the finest details of of capturing an idea for a song or the direction of a song and those are the most challenging to get because it's it's a little bit of experimentation, yeah. a little bit of trial and error, um, and sometimes the gear doesn't work the way that you want it to. <laughs> yeah, that's true too. I yeah. think maybe also, especially you know, if it's something that you've an idea you've been developing over a period of weeks, like you said, you worked mm-hmm. on a demo for weeks, mm-hmm. like that last ten percent is elusive, right? Because there's so many decisions that have led to that point, and it's like, how do you know when it's finished? Yes. Yeah. How. Well, the the clock will tell you. The clock when, tells you, yeah. That's <laughs> the answer finished. always. Deadlines. Yeah, yeah. Deadlines will tell you, but because I bet you, if we had another day, or maybe even oh, a, we'd a, keep going for sure. Yeah, yeah, and and obviously, then we'd end up with a completely different track. Yeah. We might end up, you know, way in like the, you know, underground house. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds cool. Yeah, yeah, house genre, which I I mean that would be super fun. But I, I've heard yeah. it said that records don't get finished; they just get released. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that is very true for for those who are watching, you know. Um, so it's perfection is what, what did you say that phrase was? Perfection is the enemy of enemy of the good. Yeah, mm-hmm. I heard that from a filmmaker once. I thought that that rang true. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Definitely. Because uh, there is the potential in the studio to go down a rabbit hole yeah. if you don't give yourself a deadline. And that's why it's taken me so many years to record this song. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the song, we're going to play that um, in a second. What do you want people to know about this song before they listen to it? Well, I want people to, first of all, I hope everybody enjoys it. And because uh, Graham and I have worked really, really hard on it. So <laughs> um, I guess the, the thing that I want people to know about is, um, is that... Uh, just try to stay inspired and if you aren't inspired it's okay because uh there's another wave of that coming Mm. and i think that's what the track is about joanna it's been so much fun to work with you the last couple days on this song um likewise graham honestly it's been a blast (laughs) oh i'm so glad it's hard work right but it i mean it's fun oh we're lucky to do that yeah yeah it's it almost doesn't feel like work almost Almost. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the track is Boulevard. This is Joanna Borromeo. If you'd like to support music in Canada, please consider making a donation to the National Music Centre at studiobell.ca slash donate. NMC is a non-profit, non-governmental, charitable organization. We amplify the love, sharing, and understanding of music, and we rely on donor support to create content online and in person in our exhibitions and performance spaces at Studio Bell. Thanks. Now stay tuned for some music. Standing in the middle of it all Gusting winds blow through my hair from passing cars If I'm ever gonna get from A to B All I need to do is raise my hand for somebody to see this lone adventure is one I treasure Because the darkness seems to be on my heels I pour my heart out, I get lost and then found The greater the gratitude, the more I persevere Right. 
If you like this show, you can check out more of the National Music Center experience online by visiting amplify.nmc.ca. You'll find online performances, articles about Canadian music history, educational videos that connect science to sound, and much more. I'm Graham Lassard. Thanks to our guest today, and thank you for tuning in.